We're going to ask ourselves this question. Do you consider people and their problems an obstacle to your otherwise peaceful existence? Do you consider people and their problems as an obstacle to your otherwise peaceful existence? If people bring your problems to you and you're like, man, I don't want to hear that. It's your problem. Maybe it's yours. And maybe the problem is a heart condition. This person comes to you and entrusts you with this pain that they're dealing with and your only response is get down the road. My friend, I, I would say to you that that's a, that is a heart condition. I had a friend of mine who, who, I, uh, who I knew, um, who, he served as a youth pastor uh, years before me in this same church that, that I was serving in, actually my first ministry. And one of the things he did, uh, it's a phenomenal thing, he, he dressed up like a homeless person one day and, uh, and had a couple of liquor bottles with him and he sat out in front of his church this is a youth pastor of this church. Um, made himself all dirty, clothes all dirty, stunk. Had a couple of liquor, liquor bottles. And, and this was a small country church, a beautiful picturesque place. And he sat out by the church sign. And, and his, the rationale uh, behind him doing that was, I want to see if anybody will stop and talk to me or care about me as they make their way into worship service on Sunday morning. And what he found was not one person did it. Not one of the people that he went to church with, that he loved on, that loved him, that confessed the name of Jesus, cared enough to stop and talk to the, the homeless guy in front of their church because they were too busy getting into the worship service. Why, why would you do that? Because you look at that guy and you say, fool. Same thing we do when we pass the homeless people in, the, in, the, uh, in Minot. Say, it's probably a drunk. I'm not going to give him any money. And I'm not telling you to give him money. Don't misunderstand me. I'm just saying, don't make assumptions. View him through the lenses of Jesus. Look at him through Jesus' eyes. One who is fearfully and wonderfully made. <laughs> One who is so worthwhile, Jesus laid down his life so that he could live. And Jesus asked you to be that hospital for that sinner. I, mean, I think about the scripture that says, uh, where Jesus says, um, I have not come to call the righteous, but call sinners to repentance. Just come to be a hospital for the broken. And isn't that what the church is? A hospital for broken people. I don't know any perfect people. And if you're perfect, I, I don't want to hang out with you because I just don't have anything in common with you. How do you view people? Do you view them as fools? But there's another way that we can view people. We can view them as filth. Look at verse 32 and 33. It says, a priest happened, a priest happened to be going down the same road and when he saw the man, he passed by him on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place, he saw him and passed by on the other side. So let me paint the picture for you. The pastor of the church walks by as he sees this parishioner, probably somebody he knew, naked and bleeding along the side of the road. And he said, you know what? I, I can't stop because I have to get to church. I got a sermon to preach. And then uh, uh, coming by after that was a Levite. Who was a Levite? A Levite was, was part of the priestly family in Israel, but he wasn't a part of the line of Aaron. He wasn't a direct descendant. He was like a cousin. And, and a lot of the Levites were like social workers. So a social worker comes by after the preacher walks by and pays no attention. The social worker comes by and says, you know what? I, I, I'm singing worship today. I'm leading. Or i got to be an usher. I, I, I don't have time for this. And they just walk on by. How can you do that? The only way that you can do that is look at that individual and say, you are filth. You are scum beneath my toes. Not worthy of my time. And, and we say the same thing. 
This is what we do. We look at situations like that and we say one of two things. We say, they are out of my league. I'm better than them. I'm not going to lower myself to that person. Or it's beyond my comfort zone. If I stop, he might ask me for something. I, I, I might have to give of myself. And, and, or I don't know his name. He might be from a different heritage. He might not be Norwegian. He might not be German. He might be uh, from another state. He might be from another denomination. I, I can't. Okay? We do that very same thing. And, and, and it's not just us. Jonah did it too. Do you remember the, the story of Jonah? Jonah chapter one, just profound. God comes to Jonah. And, and, and just think about the profundity of that. God speaks. He says, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. This is a, uh, their sin uh, cries out to me. And I want you to go there and, and call them to repentance. And what God is saying, go and tell them that the, the clock is ticking, but I love them. They need to get their hearts right with me. But Jonah, what's he do? He says no. And not just say, does he say no. He jumps on a boat and goes thousands of miles away, running from what God called him to do. Why? That didn't happen in a vacuum. The reason Jonah did that was the Ninevites were Assyrian. And Assyria came and conquered his people. Okay, They took the Israelites away in captivity. And then they sent their own people to the promised land. And they took the Israelite women and they had children with them. And out of which come the Samaritans. Which leads into this story, right? And the Samaritans were so hated by the Jews that they would literally walk around the entire region of Samaria so that they wouldn't contaminate themselves with this filth. Okay? Jonah ran from the call of God. Why? Because he considered the people that God called him to filth. And what was his justification? The Ninevites had heard him. You know, the Ninevites were cruel, cruel people. They were known for taking their prisoners and skinning them alive and uh, pouring salt on them, on their open wounds or burying them uh, up to their neck after they'd been skinned alive just to uh, make them suffer more. So it's, they're, they're not kind-hearted people, but God looked at them, these wicked people, and saw something redemptive in them and says, Jonah, I want you to go to your enemy. I know how you feel about them, but go. And he says the same thing to us. And the question we have to ask ourselves, is, it, is this how we see people? Ask yourself this question. Are certain people just not worth it? Are there certain people that you know that are just not worth the sacrifice? Because A, they hurt you, or B, you're just too busy. You got other things going on. Okay? If that's the case, my friend, my brother, my sister in Christ, I would say that your view of people is something beneath you. You have elevated your view of yourself and stepped away from the view that God has of people. Okay. And this is true of me. As you put up that picture of, uh, of Chelsea, I told you guys this story before, but um, I was a... My first uh, ministry was um, as a youth pastor in uh, Heath, Ohio. And I met this girl. Her name is Chelsea Frick. And uh, Chelsea was a girl that I met uh, at the Indian Mound Mall. I used to take my teenagers out there every Friday. And we'd have a group of at least 10 teenagers plus the old man. And we would go and we'd witness to people. We'd talk to people about Jesus. You know, the world says, don't talk about Jesus. Well, we're just going to talk about him. And uh, we saw people come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior right there in the mall. It was awesome. And watch 15-year-old kids lead others to Christ. Great thing. 
Chelsea, I saw at the mall literally a thousand times, and every time I walked by her, there was just this, uh, the Spirit of God in my heart said, Mike, she's the reason you're here. I want you to talk to her. But Chelsea was scary. And I'm 25 years old, okay? 25-year-old man, captain of my football team in high school, okay? Um, and a 16-year-old girl terrified me. Why? The group of people that she was around, they, they looked kind of mean. Looked like they didn't want to talk to me. And I don't think they did. Uh, they all dressed in dark clothes. And frankly, looked like they would rather slit my throat than talk to me. But every time I, talk, every time I walked by her, I felt God saying, Mike, she is why you're here. And every time I walked by, the story ends this way. I woke up one morning, opened up the newspaper, and Chelsea's picture was in the newspaper. She and a couple of friends had been out um, drinking and doing drugs, and uh, they were in a car accident about two miles from my house. The ironic thing was she lived about 40 miles from where I live. But two miles from my house, she rear-ended a garbage truck and she and uh, three other friends in the car were killed instantly. One of those kids walked away. Okay. God called me to love the least of these, to love Chelsea's, and, and, and to tell her about Jesus. He didn't tell me to convert her, because I can't do that. He didn't tell me to save her. He just told me to tell her how in love he was or is with her. But because I was scared, because um, I was too busy doing these other things, talking to these other people, because I felt like maybe I was a little bit better than them, I never opened my mouth. And because of that, I don't know where Chelsea spends eternity. Why? Because I had a low view of Chelsea. Are there certain people in your life who you consider just not worth it? My mistake was to follow down that road. Now this is my regret. This is what I gotta live with the rest of my life, not knowing when I could have said something that may have changed her eternity. And my hope is that Chelsea is in heaven. But knowing what I know about her life, she wasn't living in a way that would depict in any manner that she knew Jesus. And she could have known him if I would have told her. How do you view people? Do you view them as filth? And then finally, the final way we can view people is as family. Okay, let's pick it up in verse uh, 33. It says, But a Samaritan, as he traveled, he came to where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds and poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own donkey and took him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two pieces of, uh, or two silver coins and he gave them to the innkeeper and he said, look after him. And, and he said, when I return, I will re reimburse you for any extra expenses um, that you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hand of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So here's a picture. The Jews of the day, the, the fellow congregation members, the fellow church members, saw their brother laying beaten and broken, and they walked by. The pastor walked by. The worship leader walked by. But his enemy comes by, a Samaritan, one who wouldn't even talk uh, to. He stops by. He bandaged the guy up. He takes oil and wine, uh, treating his wounds, being hospitable to him, somebody who didn't even likely uh, care for his existence. He bandaged him up. And not only that, he put him on his own donkey, meaning that he had to walk the rest of the way so that this guy could ride along. And then he takes him to an inn and he cares for him for an entire day and then pays his expenses uh, until he's well enough so he can leave. Okay? 
This Samaritan who was rejected by the 